Heaven. Jesus ascended to heaven. Heaven. Most folks tell me they want to go to heaven. Heaven. That's the opening of today's sermon title, Heaven. We've never done it that way before. The famous last words of dying churches. We've never done it that way before, but it's also uh, the watchword of heaven. We've never done it that way before. Uh, we are coming today to a central passage and a central statement amid a central passage in Luke's gospel about Jesus and why he came and what it would mean to be a Christian, what it means to be a person fit for heaven, what it means to be a person on, on the way to heaven and already in heavenly communion. Jesus says in Luke chapter 5, picking up at the second half of verse 31 and heading into verse 32, those who are well, and Jesus is being ironic or even sarcastic here, those who are well, who think they're well, have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous. Again, Jesus, I mean the righteous king of heaven is being ironic here, talking about people like us on earth. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Today we're going to be dealing with our way of seeing ourselves and our way of being right, that's the old way, versus Jesus' gospel, truth, and grace. Remember John 1, 17, law, the law came through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus says, the truth, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And Jesus ultimately says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The way most people, maybe all people in our flesh, do religion, and that includes, because we are people in the flesh, our tendency, even among those of us who are Christians, is to say, here's, here's what I, the way I see it. I'm basically good. Some of those other people have bigger problems than I do. I'm basically good. But I will admit the following five or six problem areas I have. And yeah, I, maybe I've been around Christian talk and Christian church enough to know I need to so-called repent about these areas. Let's say I've got a little problem with anger sometimes when I'm driving, you know. Or I've got a little problem communicating with my wife or my teenage son or daughter. And, you know, maybe I said some things I shouldn't have said last week, so I, I guess I better go ahead and confess that to God. And uh, I need some help. I'm not the brightest student, so in order to pass or in order to get a professorship, I'm going to need God's help on that. I'm willing to admit that. So I'm going to go ahead and pray to him on that. And, you know, I'm basically good, but if God can just bring in a few patches, kind of like on a, a house that just needs a little bit of paint, a little bit of new paint, a little bit of repair work here or there. And I'm willing to be all in on that. That's a good religion. Amen? Amen. And I'm saved. I repented after all of my two or three or five or six sins, and I got right with God, and we are good to go. Amen? Amen. That is not salvation. That is not Christian faith. But our flesh tries to tell us, that's what, you know what, I got, I got some problems with my marriage, so I'm going to start going to church a little bit more, talk to God a little bit more, maybe add a prayer into my daily uh, routine, and I'm going to get my marriage fixed, and we're all, that is not salvation, <laughs> that is not salvation, that's patching, that's patching. Uh, we're dealing with the way we see ourselves and the way God sees us, the way you and I are, we all are in the presence of the holy, eternal living God. And here's the reality. Our essential issue before God is not sins. Sins are of consequence. But if I had COVID a year or two ago, and I said, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm COVID, I've got fever, I've got everything else. If you could just give me some cough medicine so I wouldn't cough quite as much so I'll feel better about myself and look good to other people, then the cough medicine is going to cure me. If I have cancer and I say NyQuil helps me sleep at night and I'll take a shot of scotch to make me calm down and that'll deal with my cancer, I'm talking about symptoms. The cough, yeah, that's a problem. The underlying illness and condition 
is the real matter before us. So here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, and the gospel truth says, and Jesus says, you and I are sinners who commit sin. <laughs> the sins are the secondary issue. They're a tertiary issue. The issue ultimately is you and me. You and I are sinners before an almighty holy God. And we are called to radical acknowledgement of that and radical giving of ourselves totally to him, trusting in him, and understanding that once we have trusted in him, it's not a matter of, well, I got that right. You know, when I was 16, I came forward. When I was 25, I, you know, after we had our first child, I kind of got right with God. No, 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 no. You are still a sinner. And every day we live, we may be justified and sanctified in Jesus, but it is a process. It is a living relationship. If I showed up at my wedding and said, you know, I had some good feelings in my heart for Nancy, and I, I, I made the professions, you know, and I even signed some cards. Amen? Hey, good, good. In front of a lot of people. And then occasionally when I kind of want to get in touch with her, I get in touch with her if I got a problem or whatever. Am I really living out a marriage? Am I married? Well, hey, I made that commitment. You know, I showed up, said the vows for 15 minutes, felt good in my heart for 30 minutes. No. Heaven. Heaven. We're talking about heaven, and we're talking about not the old way, but his way. And, and what is heaven? We've never done it that way before. It's not our way of seeing ourselves and getting ourselves right with God. I got, I'm, I got myself all right with God. Don't worry about me. Jesus is gospel, truth, and grace. Those who are well, and again, Jesus is being ironic, even sarcastic here. Those who are well have no need of a, of a physician, but those who are sick. Do you know you're sick? Do you realize you have a terminal issue? Even belonging to Jesus, it is a daily call to repentant faith. Martin Luther got this totally right. Saving faith leads to a lifetime of repentant faith, turning constantly toward the Lord for our sanctification. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners, Jesus says. People who know and will admit they've got a foundational radical problem, and they need a radical gospel of a God who is so loving and so full of grace that nothing short of him coming and saving me is what I need, like every day. So we're talking about people's likes and traditions and religion, old wine, versus heavenly bridegroom and his feast of celebration to which he invites sinners. That's new wine. What's heaven like? Well, all we got to do is turn to the book of Revelation. Revelation 19, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. What's heaven going to be like? A huge marriage supper. And guess who the bridegroom is? The Lamb of God who died for our sins and is now indeed the victorious reigning lion. What's heaven going to be like? Revelation 21, verse 5. He who was seated on the throne, and you have to understand this, not only is Jesus at the right hand of God, a bridegroom in the seven-day wedding feast festival wore a headdress or a crown indicating that he's like the king, right? Y'all hear me? In the Jewish wedding, seven days. Of, so Jesus is the bridegroom. He who was seated on the throne said, Behold! I am making all things just like Uncle Harry always liked to do it. Is that what Jesus says? Is that what Revelation 21? Yeah, when I get to heaven, I'll, I, guess, I guess old Uncle Harry will be doing exactly what he did here on earth because heaven surely is a continuation of our fallen, going to hell in a handbasket world. Is that what Jesus says? No. We'll just play the same music I always like because heaven's about me, isn't it? Am I the king of heaven when I go to heaven? Are you the queen? No. Behold, I am making all things, what does Jesus say? Can anyone fill in the blank here? 
Same old, same old. I'm making all things new. Never done it like that. Heaven, we've never done it that way before. Well, let us now consider our scripture for today. We're going to be turning to, we've been moving our way through Luke chapter 5. We come to the concluding passage or passages of Luke chapter 5. And then I'll also read a verse from Jesus' great series of parables in Luke 15. And after these things, picking up at verse 27 of Luke 5, he, this means Jesus, went out and looked upon a toll collector named Levi, sitting at the toll booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he arose and began following him. And Levi made a massive feast for him in his house. And there was a large crowd of toll collectors and others who were with them reclining, by implication, at table. By implication, at table. They're, they're all reclining in. You know the way they did the meal, the massive meal in this case. Huge feast. Hours on end. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with toll collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said to him, John's disciples fast often and make prayers. And so do the Pharisees' disciples, but yours eat and drink. Then Jesus said to them, can you make wedding attendants fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine, fermenting in other words, will burst the skins and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says, the old is good. And then to um, basically the central punchline of Jesus' first in three parables that he tells the Pharisees and all the people when uh, they're complaining uh, leading into Luke 15. The third parable, by the way, is the, the father and the prodigal son. But the, but the first one is about the shepherd and the lost sheep. He recovers the lost sheep, takes it back to the flock on his shoulders, the shepherd does, and throws a great celebration. And Jesus says, Luke 15, verse 7, Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. On whom is heaven focused? I mean, who's actually going to heaven? Sinners who repent. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Again, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is the central proclamation statement of Jesus in this whole series that we've been looking at and continue to look at in Luke chapters 5 and 6. Uh, let's dig into our passage for today. And after these things, uh, remember this is Kaimetatalta. Uh, we've got to fill in the blank here. You could say after these things... But you could also say after these signs, because we've had three of them leading up here. So we could fill it in as after these signs that Jesus has already performed and messages he's already given connected with the signs, he went out. Uh, let's look at what, what are these three things, these three signs I'm talking about. Let's remind ourselves here. Now, you'll remember I highlighted this as we headed into this series of passages in Luke 5 and 6. 
there's a, a Greek term, a genito, that is used three times on one side and three times on the other side. It's a chiasm. In the middle is this passage we've arrived at today. We don't get a genito or chi genito. By the way, a genito means, and it came about, and it happened, it came to pass, okay? Now we get in the middle of a three and a three, the central one, and we're supposed to be paying attention to this big time, after these signs or after these things. So here's our central passage to this whole segment of Luke that we're reading in. Um, and and what, what are the three things that led up to it? First of all, the first againito is in Luke chapter 5, verse 1. And this leads into the story of the miraculous catch of fish on the uh, lake of Gennesaret in Simon Peter, in connection with Simon Peter. Simon Peter, as the first disciple who, catch this, confesses that he is a sinner. Notice this, does not confess just sins. He says, he falls at Jesus' knees and says, depart from me, I am a sinful man. Okay, Peter, gets, Peter already gets this in, in Luke chapter 5. It's the first of these three sequences here. And then Jesus calls uh, Simon Peter to go catch alive people for the kingdom. Then we get to the second one. Uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 12 and following, another agenito here. And this involves the cleansing of the man full of leprosy. Cleansing. In other words, Jesus has the power to make someone unclean, clean for heaven. This is, what, this is what's going on here for communion with God. And then the, the third of the signs and teachings of Jesus, Jesus in 5.17 and following, the third of the three first agenitos now, Jesus exercises his power as the Son of Man to forgive sin. He declares it, and he pronounces it. And he forgives the paralytic, the paralyzed man of his sin. And then the, the Pharisees go crazy about this. This is blasphemy. And Jesus asked them, what's easier to do, to forgive sin or to say to a paralyzed man, get up and walk, but so that you will understand that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then he turns to the man and says, take up your mat, take up what you're lying on, and walk. And the man does. So right after these three things, and right after Jesus has declared his authority to forgive sinners and raised someone who is spiritually and physically paralyzed to walk a new life, after these signs, Jesus went out and looked upon a toll collector. Uh, this, is a, the, this is not a publican now. This is a tolonane. This is a guy who works for the local government. This is a guy who's got a franchise at the high end under Herod Antipas, okay? This is not, this is not a guy who collects the tribute for Caesar. That's going to be an issue in Jerusalem in the last days. Remember when Jesus talks about that? That's another kind of taxation. This is a guy who collects. By the way, the name uh, Telones means like he's the end of the road guy. He, he is like, as you're trying to transport stuff, he's gonna, he's gonna grab you. He's like the final customs office and he gets, he gets uh, tolls for transportation, for the goods you're carrying. He weighs stuff and, and, and listen, if you don't have money or enough money, I've got good news for you. He will give you a loan. He will finance the tolls that you need to pay at a very nice interest rate for him. And on top of this, he has freedom and he has enforcers who enforce this. He can ask whatever he decides you need to give him. Wouldn't you love to be under a system like that <laughs> where you're trying to move fish and goods around? And so Jesus looks upon this guy. And let me make this very clear. Uh, we need to move on to that, yeah. So he, a toll, toll collector named Talon. His name is Levi, and he's sitting at the toll booth. Jesus has no romantic ideas about toll collectors. Back in the Sermon on the Mount over in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, you know, you need to love your enemies. You tell me you're good for loving people who love you back. Well, even the tax collectors or the toll collectors do that. <laughs> and then, by the way, later on in Matthew's gospel, when Jesus is talking about discipline in the church, he goes through this whole sequence. And if you go to the church, in other words, like to the elders or to the authorities in the church, after complaining about somebody who's been bad, if, if you take them to the church and they still won't listen to correction, 
Jesus. Jesus says, this is in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus says, treat them as a toll collector and a pagan. <laughs> so Jesus is not in love on the face of it with toll collectors. Let me make this really clear. So we got a toll collector here. But we have the other side of this story is this. Back when John, John the son of Zechariah, is baptizing people and calling them to repentance, you may remember this in Luke chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Um, even toll collectors, Toloni, came to be baptized and said to John, Teacher, what shall we do? And notice this, John, I mean, fire and brimstone John doesn't say, give up your toll collecting, you know, drop everything, turn in all your money. He doesn't say that. All he says is this, collect no more than what you are authorized to do. Now, there's two sides to that. One is John is being very gentle with these folks. But notice, all you got to do is read between the lines here. What do they all do? They all collect a lot more than they're supposed to. And so he's saying, if you really want to repent, you're going to have to give up all this excess money that you're bilking everybody on. Now, let's remember where we're talking about. Jesus is um, in, um, in the area around Capernaum. And in this case, he's dealing with, he's going to deal with Levi, who's also Matthew, uh, known as Matthew means gift of God. And remember this, this is like across multiple centuries here, but the International Coastal Highway, also known as the Way of the Sea, that cuts up by the Mediterranean Sea, uh, cuts at Carmel, heads, uh, you see that uh, down south, and then, and then up to uh, Kinnereth, uh, or the Lake of Gennesaret, or what we call the Sea of Galilee, and it bounces along the western side, and the final bounce in New Testament times is gonna be at or right by Capernaum before you start heading north. And the reason, this is gaudy colors, but this shows you, I like this kind of, because this shows you these are different ruling areas. Uh, Galilee is under Herod Antipas. Uh, Batanea uh, and uh, Golanitis and uh, Banyas up north, uh, north uh, east is under Philip the Tetrarch, another son of Herod. The Decapolis is another area. So you're at a big international crossing point here, which means my point is Levi collects a whole lot of tolls because this is a major highway crossing point and he can make a lot of money here. Capernaum is not that big of a city, but Matthew's doing well because of its strategic location. Uh, one note on this too, Matthew is a Tolones, you're going to get in Luke's gospel an arche Tolones. That's the high guy who runs all these other guys. And his name is Zacchaeus, but we don't get to him until uh, Luke 19. But that's who, that's who Levi or Matthew is. And he went out, Jesus did, after all these signs, and he looked upon a toll collector. Now, if you and I in those days looked upon a toll collector, this is a Jew who's a traitor to his people. He's, this guy's a Levite. He's supposed to be a priest, and he's, he's, he's horrible. He's the opposite of being a priest. And he bilks us, and he charges high interest and everything. We don't like him. But when Jesus looks on him, he sees something different. Jesus looks upon Levi sitting at the toll booth. What does 1 Samuel tell us? Man looks on the what? Outward appearance. But the Lord looks on the what? Heart. The Lord looks on the heart. When God looks at you, he's looking at your heart. Not on, not on what other people see, whether good or bad. He looks at the heart. That's what God tells, um, you know, proclaims with respect to his choosing of David, the eighth son of Jesse, to be the once and future king. So Jesus looks at this guy's heart. And let me say this, too, in addition to Levi's heart. The guy, because of where he is, he speaks several languages. He's multilingual, probably speaks up to four languages. He's running this central intersection in an international area. He's very good with detail. He's highly literate. He, you know, if Jesus preaches a sermon like the Sermon on the Mount, he's not going to be the guy who says, I don't know, he said something about love. He's going to remember everything to the finest detail. Can this guy be used later in the kingdom work of the church? What do you think? Absolutely. So 
he, Jesus says to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he arose and began following him. Just breaking this down a little bit to make this clear. Uh, leaving everything is an aorist participle. It happens decisively. I mean, it is decisive. Okay, he leaves everything. That is a decision. That is a decisive moment. He arose, decisive, aorist participle, and then began following him. That's imperfect indicative. It is going to be a lifelong process to follow Jesus. Your Christian life, if you have a Christian life, is not like, well, yeah, I made a decision one time when I felt really good about Jesus for 15 minutes. It's not that. It's not like, yeah, I signed a card. It is a life of following him. Levi arose. Let me highlight this for you. Anastas. There it is. That's decisive also. Air is participle, and it's the same verb that relates to what? The resurrection, anastasis. We've got a man who is dead spiritually who arises. And this also links back to, remember the paralytic I talked about? Back in the previous passage, Jesus commands him to raise himself up and to pick up his mat and go home. And immediately he rose up. Same verb. He's a man who's physically and spiritually dead, but Jesus has just forgiven his sin, forgiven him as a sinner, and he gives him new life, a new way to walk. That's, that's all a parable about Christian life. So this guy gets up and walks. So, so both these folks... The, the paralyzed man and Levi rise from death to life and follow Jesus. And he, Levi, made a massive feast for him, Jesus, in his house. And there was a large crowd of toll collectors and others who were with him reclining at table. I mean, can you believe this? It's, we're not talking about two of the best toll collectors. kind of. A, the whole crowd comes. And, and a bunch of other people, probably some of their enforcers, some of their other people who bilk other people and are not the greatest folks in town. And they all come, and Jesus is reclining with them for hours. In the Hellenistic world, you had what's called a symposia. Jesus is teaching them. He's the guest of honor. This is going on for hours. This is why we get all these parables and all this teaching going on when Jesus is reclining at table with people. It's not just to eat. You are He's totally associating them with them. He's communicating with them. He's communing with them but he's also teaching them. So it's a symposia in, in process. That's the way they did it. The Pharisees, the, the term there, the Pharisee, uh, it means uh, separatists, the ones who divide. The, the Pharisees, they divide themselves from the bad people. The Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with toll collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Interestingly, in Luke 7, 29 and 30, when you going back, kind of replay of John's ministry, it says, when all the people heard this, the toll collectors too, even the toll collectors, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. In other words, a bunch of toll collectors come and get baptized. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. I'm righteous. I don't need this. That's what they're saying. They don't acknowledge they're sinners constantly in need of God's grace. And Jesus is also condemning the Pharisees in this conversation. Among other things, Jesus is specifically citing Ezekiel 34 with this passage I keep repeating to you. Ezekiel 34, verse 4. God says the weak, he's, he's calling out the bad shepherds of Israel. And he says this, the weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed. Do you hear that? This is Jesus' physician talk here. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back like a shepherd with the sheep, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. Now fast forward to verse 11. Catch this. For thus says the Lord God, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. In other words, I'm coming down. And Jesus just said, I am he. That's what he just said in this passage I keep repeating to you. Jesus just said, I am, Ezekiel 34, 11. There it is. Keep going. Um, later on, Luke 15. All the toll collectors and sinners were drawing near to Jesus to hear him. The Pharisees and the scribes, they keep grumbling, saying, This one receives sinners, hermosaloi, and eats with them. And he told them this parable. 
What man among you has 100 sheep and having lost one of them will not leave the 99 in the field and go search out the one lost sheep? I'll come back to that. Um, they complain, John's disciples fast and often make prayers. So do the Pharisees' disciples, but yours eat and drink. John's disciples complain the same way. It's probably an ongoing, it's coming in from all sides at Jesus, and he's discussing this apparently at table and by extension to them. Jesus said to them, can you make wedding attendants fast while the bridegroom is with them? It makes no sense. Can you imagine just at a regular, regular wedding reception showing up and saying, I'm sorry, I don't want any food, we're fasting, or showing up in black and mourning at somebody's wedding? It wouldn't go over that well, would it? And this is a seven-day festival. They're supposed to be totally, you know, celebrating the goodness of God and creation. Can you make the wedding attendants fast? I mean, these are the attendants, too. The sons of the, of the, of the, the bride chambers, literally the, the language there. Can you make the wedding attendants fast while the bridegroom is with them? No. Here's Isaiah 61.10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He's covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress. Remember the way I said they normally have like a crown on them? And Jesus is the bridegroom, right, in heaven and for anybody who actually is a sinner who comes to him for salvation. And as a bride adorns herself with jewels. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, you've ruined both. You've ruined the new garment because you cut it up, and it's going to tear up the old one anyway. It's not going to work. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. It's going to ferment and blow up the old wineskins. They don't mix. Dean will get into this a little more next week in application. He says, Jesus says, new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, this is unique to Luke, he has this final line from Jesus, and no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says, the old is good. I like the old. I like the way I like it. So here's the bottom line. With Jesus, repentance and salvation are not achieved by righteous actions, rituals, good feelings, saying the right things, or getting things right with God. I know that's the way most people talk. That is not salvation. That's not Christian faith. That's not, I'm the way, the truth, the life to heaven. But repentance and salvation are an ongoing new creation celebration and a wedding feast with the bridegroom, a party for sinners who know they are sinners, not just were sinners, they are sinners right this very minute, saved in the total amazing grace of God and who therefore are compelled, true Christians are compelled to invite others to Jesus and to the party. Paul got it right when he said, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, and then he quotes an early saying of the Christian church, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, not the righteous, to save sinners. And then Paul adds this tagline. It's awesome. Paul says, of whom I am, Notice this, not once was. I am right now as the apostle who served the Lord for multiple decades, who's brought thousands to faith, who spread the gospel, of whom I am the chief, the foremost, the worst of the sinners. Paul understands it. Even justified and sanctified and being sanctified before the Lord, I'm still a sinner, totally in need of his grace. Paul gets it. So Levi left everything, arose, and followed him. And as the father says when the prodigal son comes home, this is what, this is what heaven is like. He's never done it this way before. Bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate, because this, my son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. That's what Jesus is doing with Levi. That's what Jesus does with everyone who is saved. And Jesus says this. Um, you know, when the toll collectors are coming around Jesus and the Pharisees are complaining. When Jesus tells the first of three parables, this one about the shepherd bringing home the lost sheep, he says, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who don't need to repent. Because by the way, they don't match with heaven. The self-righteous 
the self-religious people don't match. Heaven. We've never done it this way before. Hallelujah! It's going to be new. And he who was seated on the throne, throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation every day. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.